Well, welcome everybody to our general meeting. And uh, Sean, I see you're here already. So we're looking forward to your, your talk. Um, uh, Fran, were you going to introduce Sean? Yes. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Um, uh, do we have any other uh, business beforehand? Anything I don't to... think we have any other business this month. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first, We're I want to say... Holly talk. What was that? The Holly talk. Yeah. Is that is that happening? Yeah. Aaron? I have everything. Sharon's Aaron's already. So let's. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I wonderful. Okay. Well, what you want to do, folks? Okay. Is if you're not on a phone, you want to hit, um, change from gallery to speaker view. And Aaron Schoenberg, our um, newest board member, has uh, put together some information about Yop and Holly. Yop and Holly. Yop and Holly. Is that how you say it? Yopan. Yopan. I call it Yopan. 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 Yeah. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Although I didn't look that part up. Um, <laughs> is it okay for me to share my screen? Yes, yeah. you can share. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. All right. I will try to go fast, but I ah. kind of got carried away. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead. And... Yeah, so this is a new feature we're going to do. Um, every month we're going to have a, another plant okay. to share with you. So I have a billion things. Oh, shoot. Okay. I thought I got rid of my, I thought I went to uh, speaker view. All right. So the Elex Vomitoria. I just, before I start, I'm an enthusiast. I'm not an expert. Lots of this was grabbed from the internet, the Florida Native Plant Society to start with, and then some really cool articles. I am not claiming to know everything 100%. <laughs> but I tried. Okay, so how do we do this? All right, so the uh, Florida Native Plant Society basics. Um, uh, you've got the family genus species. It's a tree form, although it can be in a shrub. Uh, the trees eight to 25 feet tall, not too wide, five to eight. Um, then there's also the dwarf variety that um, only gets to be about four feet tall, about five feet wide. It is a long-lived perennial, has white flowers, red fruit. It is an evergreen. Um, it has, oops, it has showy flowers, showy fruit, very interesting foliage. Um, a, my two cents, it's a very hardy plant. Oops, okay. So this is a lot. Um, they recommend it as a specimen, um, but you can use it as a hedge. You can use it... Um, like I said, it's a shrub, a hedge, a tree form. Something I didn't know, it is naturally, is it clonal? Um, yes. So you can, you can just chop a piece off and give it a little uh, root uh, promotion if you want and stick it in the soil and it, it's good to go. Um, you can, it's, it's available in a lot of places. It is available in big box stores. Just make sure that you're getting the native variety. Um, there's a Japanese version out there, so make sure you know your sources. Um, as far as sun goes, full sun, part shade. I've had them around my house in different spots. They're, they seem happy no matter what. Um, dry, moist. Um, they can handle very, very dry. Um, out of all the plants, I've never seen them have any issues in my yard. Um, personally speaking, they seem to do quite well. Uh, let's see here. Um, as far as the soil goes, it says sand. Um, and as far as I understand, you don't you really need to add anything um, to get them going. Like I said, they're very hardy. They're also good with uh, salt. Um, so they're they're not too bad um, if you're if you're coastal. Uh, let's see. Oh, yep. Birds love them. They've got cool branch structures, so the birds get to make nests in there. Bees for the flowers. Um, and it looks like they're, yeah, they're pretty much everywhere. Coastal shrubs, dunes, flatwoods, swamps, scrubs, woods, they're everywhere. Um, the distribution, it's not on this image, but it's basically central Florida up. It goes all the way into the Carolinas and out to Texas. Um, and you can grow them anywhere in Florida. And then there's the history. Oh boy, did I have fun with the history. Um, it was called Casina by the Native Americans. Um, 
let's see. The vomitoria thing is not relating to it being, um, is it emetic? If I'm saying it right, it does not make you vomit. Um, the Native Americans had a ceremony where they would fast and they would then drink very large amounts of this tea and then force themselves to vomit. Mostly, I think they, they were worried about having lethal amounts of caffeine um, on an empty stomach and it was supposed to be a purification cleansing ceremony. The English came over and they saw that and uh, like it says here, it was officially named Elex Vomitoria by William is it Aton. He was the British gardener for the king. Um, he, he saw them doing this and he thought that it made them vomit. Um, and then you can actually still see it in the dictionary described as something that is a, a medic, but it's a myth. I thought that was a cool fact. Um, there's evidence that they had seashells used and they were put on the burial all the way back to 200 AD in Florida. There's lots of varieties. Here's some, here's four. There's the shelling, which is the dwarf, pendula, which is the weeping female, well, Fleming, male upright variety. I didn't know that it was a male only, but now I do. The scarlet peak, which is the female upright variety. And I have some pictures for you. On the left here is the dwarf variety. Then we have the second one in, the weep weeping um, variety. Then we have the Will Fleming. And then the last, the scarlet. And then this is, this is my two cents on design with the holly. They're so cool. You can do like anything with them. Um, they're very good with pruning. And um, there's examples here. The one up on top, number one is, a, is if you go crazy uh, with the weeping variety. Uh, the Will Fle Fleming, ironically, does not need to be pruned. So that's number two down there at the bottom. It'll grow into a nice clean hedge. You don't even have to touch it. And then you have a standard Yupon holly trained into a cylinder shape and then a really cool formal on number four where they carve out. And then the one that got my attention, this is actually in North Carolina, but it is with the native Yupon holly. Uh, this is Pearl Friar's house. He's a crazy, if you haven't been, uh, haven't seen it, I have sources at the bottom. He's a crazy topiary artist. And um, this is what he did with some Yupon hollies in his driveway. Wow. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> uh, oh, and then I was like, oh, and then of course there's Eau Naturelle. That's what they would look like if you saw them um, for some examples, if you saw it in the, uh, in the woods naturally, just kind of spreading out. Um, ironically, I took the picture on the right from a guy's website who said that they were awful because they, they make you vomit, but I liked his picture. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah, so basically they're a hardy plant, very adaptable in landscape. They're salt tolerant, they're freeze tolerant. Um, and then this part is super cool. So uh, it is the only caffeinated plant. The genus is the only caffeinated plant in North America. There's also the Ilex cassin, which is the Dahoon holly, which is caffeinated as well. Um, they are also cousins to the South American yerba mate, which is also an Ilex. And they have 30% less caffeine than coffee. So it's about 66 milligrams per cup. Oh, I forgot to finish that sentence. Okay. Uh, they, are, they were called Cassina um, by the Tamuka people, the Native Americans. They are tannin free. So you can steep this tea as long as you want and it's not gonna be bitter. Um, what else? Yep. Oh, it was super popular in North America. It was widely available. It was even exported to Europe and it had names like Carolina tea, South Sea tea. Um, and then the French called it Appalachina, which was because they, I think that, re, that one came from the Appalachian um, people in North Carolina. Um, what else? Oh, so it became so widely available and it was actually very affordable. Um, unlike the pricey options for imported teas and then coffee was actually becoming popular too, but it was pricey, that it became declassé to drink it according to the rich. Um, and then by the end of the Civil War, um, it was just uh, very, very, it, it wasn't popular. Um, and in fact, there was an encyclopedia entry from 1883 that said, quote, still used as a beverage by the poor classes in North Carolina. <laughs> but fortunately for us, it is popular again. Um, it's in niche, niche markets. 
It is an environmental friendly and native plant option. So people like maybe us, myself, for example, um, it, it is an option and something for us to do. Um, cool facts. There is a native Yupon Holly Tea Company right in our backyard, sort of. It's in Florida. Um, the Yupon Brothers, they uh, grow an uh, organic farm, tree farm, and a, they say that it's where the um, Indians, where some Native Americans were uh, doing the farming with them previously, all the way back to 8,000 years ago. Thought that was kind of mm. cool. Uh, so uh, there is a little video if you want to see something. It's five minutes. I don't know how fast I've gone. Um, do we have time? But it's two minutes. Sorry, it's two minutes. Let's, see. Let's do it. Two minutes. Okay. Great. Oh, your speakers. I. I don't. Is there sound or? Oh, no sound. No. Okay. Well, it's a really cute video about a guy who's been doing some stuff for a while. It looks like P. Allen Smith. Oh, yes. Um, the garden. Yes. Why don't yeah. you put the link in the chat? I have a source page. So okay. let's see. I will go to the source page. It's cute. He shows you it, the, the trees in the wind. Oops. I'm going to try to get out of here now. How do I get out? Escape. Escape. There we go. Okay. Nope. Oh. Here. And I, okay, and I think that's the last of it. So yeah, this would be the presentation of the sources. And I can, they're all hot links. I don't know if there's a way for me to, to give it Unless to you. But the... you put them in the chat box. Which okay. You so yeah. there, yeah, the Florida Native Plant Society, Wikipedia, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, there was a, a really cool, History of Casino, um, Native Holly Tea. Mike Adams did a really cool article. Um, and then there's that article on Pearl Fryer and his his crazy garden. Then there's the Yupon Tea site and the video. Okay, that's it. Yupon oh. Holly, yay! Oh. Thank you, Aaron. That was wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Oh. Wonderful. Thanks yeah. so much. Nice job. Oh, great. Um, Aaron, just while while Sean's speaking, if you would copy and paste those into the chat and then I can I will. See, um, and get them for folks. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. great research. Yeah. <laughs> Super. Okay. Right. Uh, I am going to talk about Sean Patton, our guest tonight. We are so excited to have him come and talk about aquatic gardening. A little of his background. He's a graduate of New College, studied marine biology and ecology there. He's been an aquatic biologist in Sarasota and Manatee counties. He's been doing restoration work on wetlands, ponds, and lakes. And he has a, an organization that he founded called Stocking Savvy. And I'm sure he can tell you a little bit about it, but we're just delighted to have him speak to us. So here is Sean Patton. Thank you, Fran. And also thank you, Aaron. I always love hearing more about the history of our native plants. And for anyone who wants to know another great story on Yalpon Holly, look up Chief Osceola, the Black Drink Shouter. He has a really cool history with uh, Yalpon Holly. But now we are going to delve into the weird and wonderful world of wetland gardening, where most Floridians live on or near a wetland. So let's get started. All right. So, oh, so we don't block, there we go. All right, so this is Aquatic Butterfly Gardens and Pondside Living. And this very first picture is actually a newer project that myself and some of my staff did with floating islands. If you have any questions, there will be a halfway point where I can answer some quick ones. 
And otherwise we'll just get started. So what is the goal for aquatic gardening? Oh, there we go. So the goal for this presentation is mostly to focus on good pollination habitat, which is anything that flowers obviously and adds to the aesthetic value, but also to help bring in more butterflies, moths, and other animals to these ecosystems. And in wetlands, I've seen over 20 species of butterflies, some of which are obligate wetland species, um, like this plume moth that specifically eats irises. I've also seen queen butterflies and monarchs on several of our aquatic milkweeds. So everyone knows that butterflies need two plants, host plants and pollinators. Host plants are generally eaten by the butterflies or moths, and it is restricted to one to three species, usually per family, though there are a few butterfly generalists. And then there are the pollinator plants that most butterflies have a few set pollinator plants that they enjoy, though some plants can be host and pollinator plants. And this one, Asclepia perennis, is also known as the aquatic milkweed and is one of the more common aquatic plants that I use in some wetland gardens. It also makes a great shade plant in slightly drier areas. So this is one of the big things that people need to think about when you look at a pond, is that there are four fairly distinct zones. Upland zones, which are only covered during a flood. Riparian zones, which are really only covered um, during you know high water mark, and that's usually only by an inch or two. Emergent zones, which are usually wet feet um, for most of the year, sometimes during the winter they'll dry out, and then littoral, which is never um, not covered in water. Most of the plants that are very colorful, you'll notice, are in the riparian and emergent habitat. However, when most ponds are designed, it is an upland straight to a littoral zone. So whenever you're thinking about living next to a pond, look for this nice gentle slope. This is really important. And this is something that unfortunately a lot of developers do not put into their lakes. It usually tends to be pickerel weed and deeper and upland zones. All right, some general best management practices for stormwater ponds are you want those shallow low grade slopes. This is actually a nice one that I found in Sarasota. Um, you want nice gentle slopes. This is also known as a littoral shelf right here. It's an area left shallow for plants to grow. Um, you want only, you don't want any like large trees near these outfall structures. Um, large trees can actually block them and cause a lot of flooding. And the last thing you want in your house is more flooding in Florida. So let's try to stay away from that. Um, and you also want a diversity of native species. I thought a lot of you would appreciate this, especially in the Native Plant Society. But of the top 10 most invasive plant species, I believe more than half of them are aquatic plants with the most invasive plant in the world, water hyacinth being an aquatic plant. So you always wanna make sure that you're including native plants, fish, and invertebrates. You also want to make sure you're regularly maintaining invasives to prevent their spread. And a lot of invasive aquatic plants will absolutely take over. And of course, anything you can do, especially through plantings, to reduce herbicide, pesticide, and fertilizer use is great. A lot of herbicides will damage your beneficial plants, obviously. Pesticides will damage your beneficial insects. And fertilizers cause algae blooms. So some challenges for aquatic gardening. Oh, we don't need that. So the biggest challenge to aquatic gardening is the depth of water. If we go back to that earlier slide where we were looking at that nice slope, the slope is generally the biggest problem when it comes to aquatic gardening. So if you don't have that nice shallow slope, a lot of plants will get drowned. And some plants are annuals in the water and it's okay if they drown, they'll come back when it seeds. And many plants rely on that ebb and flow in order to seed. Fluctuating water levels. Some ponds will fluctuate up to 10 feet. Others will not. So it really depends on whether you're spring fed, whether you're pump fed, and how much of your lake is actually set up around um, water levels. This can really impact the species you plant. Cypresses, for instance, are really good with high water levels and changing water levels. Whereas something like a uh, blue flag iris or uh, crinum lilies are not. Soil types and sedimentation tend to be less important. 
Most of the time it's either mud or sand that you're dealing with, though I have seen some other soil types. Um, in general, it's not as important as you would find on land. Most of the time, just because of the nature of water, it tends to be either um, very alkaline if you're near the coast or slightly more acidic if you're inland or um, fairly neutral. Rain and lots of water tends to always bring it a little bit back closer to neutral. Algae and aquatic weed growth is a massive issue. Do not ever fertilize your aquatic plants unless they're in an enclosed ecosystem. Most aquatic plants are fairly used to um, dealing with um, low amounts of nutrients and they'll filter that from the water or get it from the soil. Do not put fertilizer in your ponds. This generally leads to algae blooms and is why we have worse red tides and harmful algae blooms in Florida. So if you take one thing away from this is you actually wanna work on limiting aquatic plant growth in your ponds, but sometimes you limit it too much with things like aquatic herbivores. I have seen this turtle right here and his friends eat hundreds of dollars of aquatic plants. So if you have a lake with a lot of turtles, you might wanna consider over planting and other um, animals, including deer, muskrat, um, gallinules and other um, wetland animals will sometimes eat your plants and water quality is generally improved through planting. So you wanna have a lot of native plants. If you don't, you can generally lower the water quality. And here we go. We see, um, this is a pickerel weed. You'll notice that it's growing just fine in soil, even though it's a emergent slash littoral plant and would do just fine right here. Most aquatic plants can do fine in shallower water, but they can't do better in deeper water. So if you're ever planting aquatic plants, go shallower rather than deeper. Um, it's always harder to get a plant to grow deeper than it is shallower. And many plants, especially um, canna lilies, duck potatoes, um, rely on this rise and fall of the water level in order to seed. Um, cypresses are another one that's big. Milkweeds are big into that. A lot of plants need this ebb and flow. And if you see this on the exposed bank, you'll notice a lot of small plants growing up. And exceptions to this are rhizomatic growth. So cattails, lily pads, rushes, they'll, you can just throw them in and they'll spread rhizomally. Algae and aquatic weeds, only plant native. Do not fertilize your palms. And aquatic plants, again, tend to have a very, are very uncontrollable. Water hyacinth and floating plants are really difficult to control. So I don't generally recommend putting in free floating plants like this. In fact, water hyacinth is closely related to the native pickerel weed and they have similar flowers and shapes, but pickerel weed is easier to work with. And these gardens are very important. You always wanna have planted shorelines in Florida. If you see a shoreline that doesn't have a diversity of plants, it's not filtering nutrients, it's not shading out algae and it's not providing habitat. Um, water lilies and wide leaf plants are the best at shading out algae and cooling down water. Many people turn to planting aquatic plants to help control algae blooms. So this is a very good thing to do. And of course, physical algae, physical removal of algae and aquatic plants can help reduce nutrients in the long term. Water quality. So these are actually two different kinds of harmful algae blooms. Kind of like red tide, you can get freshwater harmful algae blooms too. And this also happens if you spray out or kill quite a few native plants at the same time. So if you ever see a black, brown, or blue color in the water, or bright green, but bright green tends not to be toxic, stay warned. This is kind of the blue you want to be worried about, and you'll usually have a smell along with it. You'll sometimes see oils or pollutants on the surface of the water, poor water clarity with the exception of tannins from trees you might want to worry about. And of course, high nutrients or fertilizer will just cause these algae blooms. This is actually a physical chain linked algae that you can pick up and it's very nasty. And this is where um, my company does something called multimodal biological control. This is where we use native plants and native fish to help remove midge flies, mosquitoes and other macrophytes. So whenever you're dealing with an ecosystem, be sure to do native species in it. Don't go to your pet store and get a sucker fish. They'll cause a lot of damage. And so one thing that you wanna do before we get into the plants themselves are look into aquatic herbivores. So these can be fish, mollusks, snails, 
little um, microscopic organisms like copepods and turtles. And also there's a variety of birds, butterflies, moths, and mammals that can help reduce the growth of plants. Believe me, once you get a few started, they're gonna grow fairly quickly. And you want things to eat algae, kind of like if you have a planted fish tank, you wanna have things that clean up the algae and the muck growing on the bottom of your pond. And you also do wanna do a diversity of plants. If you just do one species, it increases the chance that herbivores or disease will spread. And these are just some cute animals. There's the flagfish, which is one of my favorites. They eat small floating plants and algae. Chub suckers, which are a very funny name. They help eat a lot of that goo on the bottom. Turtles, as I talked about earlier, having a few is fine. Then there are filter feeders that can help clean up the water and top minnows, which really help keep down mosquitoes. And then one thing, um, I'm also working with the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project over at Selby Gardens, and they're doing plant IDs with iNaturalist. It, we've also, the reason I'm including it in this presentation is we found a new invasive aquatic plant called Bacopa repens. So if you ever see a plant that you're not sure about, download the iNaturalist app. It's really good to use. A lot of our land managers and um, botanists use this app. It's very, very user-friendly, easy to use. We've also found four new native species. So if you ever find something new in Sarasota or Manatee, feel free to tag me in it, especially if it's aquatic. And they also do fun things like bio blitzes and plant challenges. And now we're going to go into the aquatic plants. Before I go into this, are there any big questions? I do not see anything in the chat. Anybody? Um have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask. Just a quick halfway point while I drink some water. <laughs> all right, then, without further ado, let's get into what you all came here for, the plants. So right away, um, the monarch butterfly, and if we're going to do an aquatic butterfly gardening talk, this is the one that's on everyone's mind. Many people think um, milkweeds tend to be more dune or scrubland or um, forest habitat, but there's actually two species, um, Perennis and Incarnata, that do grow in wetlands. And, a, and Perennis, the aquatic milkweed or white milkweed, can actually grow in two inches of water or less. So it can have wet feet. Um, but again, keep in mind that small plants can get drowned. So you, if you're going to plant these guys in wet soil, um, you might want to start them off in a slightly drier location. These guys are great for rain gardens. And again, they're native to all of Florida. And all the plants that I talk about in this um, talk are going to be widely available. And I made sure that either Sweet Bay, Florida Native Plants Nursery, or a nursery in Sarasota and Manatee had them. So don't worry, you all aren't going to have to be scouring half of Florida for these. Bacopa monieri, or the water hyssop, is one of my favorites because this shows what a lot of aquatic plants do. They have two forms. On land, it grows as a ground cover, and in the water, it grows as a small shrub, where the lack of gravity allows it to grow towards the surface and form a very, very cool structure, like an underwater shrub. I find it very fun to work with. It, on land, it's the host plant for the white peacock butterflies. A lot of butterflies specifically will eat these guys when the water level is low, so spring and fall, sometimes winter. And in summer, they're the butterflies and they tend to either eat them out of the water or they just aren't laying as much. So this is a great one, easy to grow, works as a ground cover around ponds and you can walk on it. So that's really nice. And several of these guys have very nice smells along with them. Great, great aquatic ground cover. Bald cypress, also pond cypress will be functionally the same. Both of them have the bald cypress sphinx moth that eats them. And this is a really cool aquatic tree that can be planted on land or in the water. And there's actually a lake in Orlando where they planted these guys in water over a feet, over a foot deep that has never changed in water level and the trees are doing fine. So we know that these guys can be permanently water bound, which is unusual for a lot of trees. And they're very, very tolerant of flooding, but the seeds will only grow in drier areas. So again, these trees are adapted to that rise and fall in water level. And any of you who are also part of the Audubon Society know that they're a great nesting tree for birds and waterfowl. 
And oh, uh, weird historical note. They're not native to large tracts of land in Sarasota County. There's kind of a gap in the map. So that's just kind of a fun historical thing. Um, it's obviously fine to plant them here, but you don't see any large cypress map like stands in Sarasota County for that reason. They tend to be either farther to the north, farther to the south, or farther to the east. One of my personal favorites is Canna Flacida, the golden canna. It gets these beautiful large yellow flowers or gold flowers. And it is also the host for the ugliest butterfly caterpillar, the Brazilian skipper, which is completely see-through, which is really cool because you can see how the um, spiracles on the side of the caterpillar um, act as their lungs. It's really cool, but also very ugly. I love it. Um, this is the Brazilian skipper butterfly. And this guy can grow in six inches of water or less. It's a riparian plant. The reason I put this right here is because a lot of people accidentally plant this in 18 inches of water due to some poor county recommendations. Some county guides have been updated, but some have not. Do not plant this deeper than six inches. It will not grow. It likes to be in swampy, shallow areas. Um, it is very hard to grow by seed. It needs an acid bath, scarification, and it does not germinate underwater, but it easily grows rhizomally even in the water, and I, that's the way I recommend growing it. Um, one of my personal favorites is the mangrove spider lily. These guys have a beautiful thin white membrane between the petals. They are extremely salt tolerant beach plant. They'll grow in full sun, part shade in dunes. So you can get these guys to grow. They're often found on mangrove and spoil islands and they flower in sets of two, which is particularly interesting. And they're a great pollinator plant. And for those of you who live say on like Lido Key or Siesta Key, these are some uh, lilies you might want to consider, um, but they are zones 10A and farther south. So be prepared, like if it gets cold that they might not do well. Um, Nymphaea odorata, another pollinator plant. And believe it or not, butterflies and bees will fly out into deeper water for these flowers. This is a great plant because it attracts gallinules, provides cover for birds and fish, is a very fragrant lily. A lot of these flowers can be almost a foot across. Like there are massive flowers I've seen on these guys and they can survive in shallow water, but they generally prefer two feet to about eight feet, though they have been seen growing as deep as 12 feet. Most lilies cannot go deeper than 12 feet. So if you're ever worried about lily pads taking over your entire lake, they're not going to do that. They max out at 12 feet, but they really prefer to grow a ring around your pond. They, jump, they don't do well in super deep water. Pickerel weed. This is one of the best pollinator plants you can get in your lakes. They have these beautiful cones of purple flowers and nice um, heart-shaped leaves. We've seen them a few times through this. They look very similar to water hyacinth. Um, Many uh, bees and butterfly species specifically nectar at pickerel weed in aquatic gardens. So this is one I would consider a must have. And it's a beautiful plant, generally can grow in up to two feet of water. So it's one of the deepest growing aquatic plants, or it can even grow as part of a floating island or weed mat. So it's one of those super deep plants that's adapted for this environment. And it's also a favorite food by waterfowl and several turtles. Button bush. I, it's a beautiful, beautiful large shrub for the edges of wetlands. So it occupies that riparian um, upland border. It doesn't like to be too deep. It likes to be, it, I, I wouldn't put it super deep in the water until it gets larger, um, but keep it around two inches or less. It's got the Titan Sphinx and Hydrangea Sphinx moths, beautiful flowers, but it is poisonous to humans and livestock. So don't um, this, along with water hemlock, you might want to keep away from livestock if you have horses or cows. Possibly one of the most famous um, aquatic plants in Florida is the scarlet hibiscus. Massive flowers. Again, some of these are the size of your head. Very large and sh showy flowers. Seeds heavily, spread by cuttings easily. And it's a riparian plant. So again, you need that nice shallow slope into your lake in order to grow these. They won't grow in deep water, but they don't like to be out of the water. And they're host for a wide variety of butterflies and moths. Um, one fun fact is that depending on the age, the amount of sunlight and where they're growing, local ecotypes, they have a very variable leaf. So as you can see, these ones are really thin. I've also seen them almost 
you know, palmate looking like maple leaves. And some people say they look quite a bit like marijuana. So I find that funny as well. And there are several different species of hibiscus, um, all of them tolerating that riparian upland border area. This one, um, hibiscus aculatus, is an extremely large showy plant, um, often confused with the Japanese hibiscus. You want to really look for that red pollen. It's very difficult to see. Um, they're a very easy to grow plant, but I find that you want to prune them a lot in order to keep them show, like showy, otherwise they'll get very leggy. And they're a shorter alternative to the scarlet hibiscus, but they're cold tolerant. Um, so scarlet hibiscus likes central and south Florida. These guys like central and north Florida. So if you're in, in an area that tends to get cooler or freezes more, consider these guys. And like most hibiscus, the flowers will close with high heat or darkness. So there's two Sagittaria I want to talk about. This one is Latifolia, also known as Arrowhead. This guy is a short, is a short riparian border plant, um, up to six inches. It can be a little deeper than other riparian plants. Um, easily grown through rhizomes, beautiful little flowers, this nice arrowhead shaped leaf. And it really encourages algae, uh, sorry, really encourages bird nesting, but shades out algae. Whereas its sister plant, Sagittaria, Lancifolia has these lance-shaped leaves, and these, this is a really good shot of the flowers they both share. This one has lance-shaped leaves, is less um, of an algae shading plant, but can grow four times deeper. It can grow two feet deep in the water. Otherwise, they're very similar plants. So this is just another thing where this one has adapted to a deeper area. And a fun fact, this one is, this along with pickerel weed and Gulf spikerush are the three most commonly used aquatic plants. And the main reason duck potato is used is because it resists the herbicide Roundup. So land managers like it because it doesn't die when you spray it. Granted, we wanna reduce herbicide spraying as much as possible, but that's a fun fact about this plant. Um, eelgrass and tapegrass is not really so much a pollinator plant, but it will send up flowers but it's great for growing deeper in the water for fish and frog habitat. It is great for water clarity along with quite a few other aquatic plants, but this is the most common one that you all will have access to. Um, in shallow water, the leaves might break the surface. There's a great exhibit at Moat with these guys, um, just that little pond in the center near the cafe. And they're just a really nice looking plant. A lot of fish and birds eat these and they're great cover and re algae reduction. So these are a few other non-flowering plants that I just wanted to go through real quick. Horsetails are great in areas that dry out regularly and then get inundated regularly. Um, they're very, very commonly used in bioswales and they're a very ancient order of plants. Caras are a giant macroalgae, so they don't actually have roots, but they anchor themselves to the bottom. And they are the best single plant for water quality but they're killed by everything that kills algae. So if you have herbicides being used in your water body, you can't use these. And ironically, they are allelopathic to many algae. So they'll kill them with the chemicals they exude. Soft rush is a great riparian rush, very, very useful for feeding birds. Whereas giant bulrush or any of the larger bulrushes like um, soft stem bulrush are very good in deeper water. So they're more of a emergent plant. And then we have white top sedge, which is a great um, upland riparian border plant. Gets these nice little um, white stars on the top. Giant leather fern, excellent in shallow swampy areas along with swamp fern if you wanted some ferns to add. And then Eleocaris interstincta, the deepest growing of any of the rushes can grow up to two feet deep. And you want some rushes if you want to attract birds. You want either spike rush or bull rush or soft rush because a lot of birds use them as nesting material. And this is one final thing. This is something new that I've added to this presentation. You all are actually the first ones to hear about it. So yay, you all are a very special group for this. Um, these are floating islands. So this is something that's been used for a long time in waste treatment plants to remove, al uh, to remove nutrients um, because you don't want a ton of nitrogen and phosphorus going back out to the environment. But now we're starting to use them on lakes and wetlands. And so not only does this control nutrients, but it allows you to plant more vegetation in these lakes where you might not be able to otherwise. And we had 
butterflies, moths, birds, fish, and amphibians all reproducing on these islands. The fish were actually laying their eggs on the undersides of the islands, which is really cool. Um, the maintenance can be either um, moderate to heavy. Um, this is cleaning off an island that was abandoned for two years. And so as you can see, it took a little bit of work, but that's what interns are for. They were paid interns, mind you, but interns nonetheless. And um, we planted them with a wide variety of butterfly plants. So that project just wrapped up and we had a wonderful assortment of butterflies, including queen of butterflies reproducing their whole life cycle on the island. We had egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and butterflies on them, which was very nice. And they're also a common basking point for reptiles. So that is about it. Thank you all for listening. Um, if you want me to go back through, I know I tend to talk fast, loud, and a lot. Um, if you want me to go back through anything or talk, touch on any subjects or individual plants, I obviously did not include every aquatic plant. There are thousands of plants native to Florida, as I'm sure you all are aware, and many of them are wetland plants. Yeah, I could talk for hours on the bladder warts, sundews, which are a great bog plant, but I tried to stick to things that are available for you all to use. And many of our coolest aquatic or wetland plants require very specific ecosystems. You won't be able to get a sundew to grow in your yard unless you're living in a almost constantly moist bog, which some people might be, but then you probably have them there already. So if you want to contact me, if you ever need help with lakes or wetlands, let me know. Um, all the plants that I use for these projects are mostly sourced through Sarasota and Manatee County. So Sweet Bay Nursery, Florida Native Plants, Davies Nursery are all great sources. And for larger projects, we do wholesale through some of the big wholesalers out in the middle of the state. But again, when you're looking at um, doing an entire lake, a lot of people are worried, like, how am I going to get 100,000 plants to plant the shoreline? Well, many of, and keep in mind about 5,000 plants will do a two acre lake. But many of these plants, when you buy in wholesale, um, and I'm talking like, you know, 5,000 plants at a time are very affordable, like maybe a dollar to a plant. So there's a lot of grants out there. So what I recommend is after this presentation, look around and see how many bare and empty shorelines ditches, depressions, retention ponds, coastal areas are just unplanted. And it's kind of mind boggling. So go out there and look for these areas and consider planting them. I've had many HOAs, um, the first native plants they have in those communities are aquatic plants to help control algae. So it could be a great way to introduce native plants to your community. So let's start going into some questions. Okay. So the first question we have is where are these cypress in this slide? Do you know what, where the oh, slide was taken? So this, I believe, was taken from, um, I think, Okefenokee. This is not my picture. I um, borrowed it from a friend. It's just a really, really nice picture. But these large cypress stands are amazing stands. And you'll the best, it's not Harrison Ranch. There is a golf club in North Bradenton County that actually has stands like this, but this is what an old growth cypress forest looks like. And again, you'll only see the cypress trees really get these big buttresses at the bottom with that ebb and flow of water because it gives them more support during flooding. In fact, some of these cypress forests have been known to flood several feet per year. So you'll get no water to several feet, sometimes four or five. So that's a really cool um, example. Yeah. All right, All right, any other questions? Yeah, Sue Lehrer asks, where did the duck plant get its name? So duck if the story holds true, the duck potato was like many plants, um, when it was first categorized by European explorers, they just kind of looked at it and named it after what they thought. So they pulled up a duck and they were like, oh, the tuber on it kind of looks like a duck. They called it a duck potato. They're not, again, early scientists were not the most clever. <laughs> like the arrowhead plants, just an arrow shape. Weak. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might, you'd have a better chance talking to an English major for some of these names. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so there were some questions about the floating islands. What materials are they made from and are they natural? So floating islands do exist in the wilds in Florida and they tend to be just um, like when cattails or rushes, they have these very spongy roots that have a lot of air in them, which keeps them you know, from sinking too deep into the soil. But sometimes these break off, and they'll float around the lakes and ponds. And in, when the Everglades was half the state, this was fine and people didn't really care because we didn't live in the Everglades. But now because we um, control these lakes so heavily and we control drainage so heavily, we can't just have floating islands all over the place. So these islands are man-made and they're specifically made out of plastics that absorb heavy metals. And you might be like, why are we doing that? That seems nuts. Why would we want to absorb heavy metals into a plastic? Well, the nice thing is the, um, they bind to the plastic instead of being leached into the plants or the environment. And then the plastic can be recycled or processed in a way that separates the heavy metals from the plastics. And then the water quality is improved. Lead, mercury, copper are all some heavy metals that cause human health effects. And these islands can help reduce that. And my company has done quite a few islands. Um, some of the biggest ones we've done are Palmer Ranch. We did a small one for the Bay Project. And the big thing about these islands is that they're endlessly modifiable. So let's go back to this island. So if you look at it, this there's several companies that make these islands too. So this island was a, um, a plastic rubber matting with a lot of holes in the middle and the matting was very buoyant. So it kept it lifted up. And then there were pots, just little holes that the pots stuck in all throughout the island. And the pots, you know, degrade after about 10, 15 years. So you got to replace the pots every once in a while. But the plant's roots just stick through the island. And that's the core goal of many of these islands is for the roots to hang in the water, no fertilizer needed, no soil needed, no substrate needed. It's just a plant, roots in the water, and it sucks the nutrients out of the water directly. If you have plants planted on the soil, they'll get some of their nutrients from the soil, some from the water. But these guys get 100% of their nutrients from the water. And as we remember in that first photo, and if you look at all this plant material, that's a lot of nutrients. So instead of this being an algae bloom, it's your favorite aquatic plants. And so, and again, because we were able to prove that butterflies can do their entire life cycle on these islands, you don't have to make it 100% cattails or fire flag which was a great plant that I should have talked about for this presentation, but fire flag is a wonderful aquatic plant. Again, there's just so many, but you can use these to soak up nutrients to fight algae blooms. And if anyone's interested in making these, feel free to reach out to me. And I've seen floating islands as small as, you know, a single container or a single pot just floating in like a little backyard pond. Um, like, you know, some of those like little tiny form fit ponds to, again, we had four, um, islands with over 2,500 plants in four lakes in Palmer Ranch. So like you can scale these up big. And again, these were made for sewage treatment plants. We just make them look a little nicer. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that was one of the questions. How big across? So they vary. Are they anchored is another question. Yes, the islands are anchored. I personally just use an old cinder block. Um, there's not much growing in the deepest parts of ponds where you want to anchor these, but um, you can anchor them with a traditional anchor and that keeps them from spreading around. You don't want them to run into a outfall or a pipe and block it and flood your house. Um, stormwater is very much based around not flooding people's houses. That tends to be the number one priority, which is why if you look at most of the plants that I recommended, not many of them were woody plants. And if you are going to put woody plants around, you either need to check your outfalls after storms or your pipes after storms to make sure they don't get blocked or keep it to herbaceous plants. If a plant doesn't produce wood, it generally won't block an outfall or a stormwater pipe. Like with roots, you mean? Well, and branches. Branches are big. Okay. All um, right. Oh, someone sent me a private message. Can pickerel weed be grown on land with good irrigation? Yes. I don't recommend it though. Pickerel weed is one of the deepest growing and most water specialized plants in Florida. I wouldn't recommend it. Golden canna I find is a much better plant to just be grown on land. And a fun trick, and this is going to make many of you um, plant people be like, 
If you want to grow aquatic plants, just put them in a pot with no drainage. A wash tub works. Yeah, a wash tub works. And again, um, a lot of aquatic plants don't mold. Um, a lot of them are very resistant to mold. They're resistant to pests. Um, they're very hardy plants. So if you wanted to grow pickerel weed, just put it in a pot without holes. And the nice thing about oh, what, um, taking care of aquatic plants is you can't overwater them. I know some of you have looked at these very delicate plants that I'm sure you've grown for other ecosystems and you overwater them or um, you over fertilize them. Well, aquatic plants, you can't overwater them and you generally don't need to fertilize them if they're out in the wild. And in pots, you don't need to give them too much fertilizer. Um, they're really, really easy to grow. All right, Erica asks, where can you get native small fish for small ponds? So sometimes you will have local pet stores that sell them. That tends to be the newest thing that my company has done. We are the first company in Florida to sell native algae eating fish. And we can ship directly to people's houses or I can come stock them myself. And we have a wide variety of fish that we use. And again, that's because um, currently in Florida, you are only required to put one thing in your ponds throughout all of Florida. And that is a mosquito fish to eat mosquitoes. All right. And people wonder why we have algae problems. In most counties, you're not required to put in any plants, not required to put in any plant eating fish, any cleaning fish, filter feeders. So I basically make a cleanup crew for your pond. You send me how big your pond is, where, where you live, and kind of what, like a few pictures of it, and I'll recommend some fish for it and get them to you. And plus, it's cute and adorable. They're little fish. All right. Uh, Richards asks if you could list plants that can be can be covered completely by water during the wet season and survive. So, okay, let's see. I'm gonna go way back up here. So being covered completely by water is not many plants. Many plants can survive being covered by water for a short amount of time, but not a long amount of time. So if we come up here to the zones, This is the emergent zone. Now look at where the high water mark is. Any plant that is growing completely below the high water mark will survive. So we're looking at pickerweed, eelgrass. Some of the rushes will survive underwater. Lizard's tail will not. Lizard's tail is a little bit shallower. I don't think lizard's tail does well in deep water. But most of these plants will survive, pretty much anything emergent over will survive temporary inundation, but only really from about the, this right half of the emergent and littoral species will survive. So pickerel weed, um, cypress trees just get too tall. Um, most rushes will survive temporary inundation and bulrushes get too tall. Firefly gets too tall and will survive. Um, some of the spider lilies will survive, but that depends on um, if they're coastal spider lilies, like the, um, they will survive temporary saltwater inundation. It really depends. Tr always go shallower rather than deeper. Oh, duck potato will survive. Duck potato will survive anything. Um, it will survive being completely underwater. Uh, lily pads will actually adjust their depth. So if you have water that's deeper than two feet, which is what a lot of retention ponds have, I recommend pickerel weed, duck potato, gulf spike rush, bull rush, fire flag, any aquatic lilies, and then any truly aquatic plant. And then again, there are some plants that, like the bacopa we talked about earlier, that have a land form and an aquatic form. So those will also survive being completely submerged. Cool. All right. I think that's it. Um, and Alexandra Co offers anyone who wants golden canna can dig them up for free at my farm. <laughs> at Swamp Castle Farm, she says. So check the, the uh, chat box if you want a canna lily. Thanks, Alexandra, that's nice. Um, all right, if I missed anything. Oh, Aaron, Lake Apopka question. Um, do floating islands or aquatic plants help filter out pollution in water? And if so, have you heard of anything like this or anything else being used to help Lake Apopka? 
For Lake Apopka specifically, I don't know. However, yes, again, a lot of these floating islands and shoreline plantings were initially used to clean up waste treatment plants, where they would cover the entire part of the waste treatment plant in plants, and then you just harvest the top. And to give you an idea of how much nutrients are being removed, the Aztec Empire in South America fed their entire civilization off of floating islands called Chinchampas. They fed one of the largest Mesoamerican empires in the world off floating islands. That's how much nutrients can be removed. And so, yes, the ability to do this for agricultural habitat or um, other uses is very high and it is effective. In fact, Naples banned all herbicide use to treat algae for several years um, as part of a larger study and a banning of herbicides that were leading to a dead zone in their Gulf. Because if you just spray everything, it leads to red tide and that causes dead zones. And that's a long story about nutrient pollution, but they found that floating islands after just two to five years made permanent long-term differences and that as long as at least 5% of the surface of the watershed is covered, you have high levels of nutrient removal. So yeah, and honestly, you could probably fix Lake Okeechobee using this method too and make money off it because you can farm on the surface of the water. And when you're farming the surface, you don't have to worry about watering. Watering is very expensive. You don't have to worry about fertilizing. That's one of the big problems that we have. You just have to worry about actually doing it. So Aaron, I'm curious why you asked specifically about Lake Apopka. Well, back in the day we were um, unfamiliar but with the area over there and we were looking at houses and everything was really cheap along the lake and I, I couldn't figure out why. And now I, and then I found out it was like super polluted and stagnant. What they did was they dredged Lake Apopka. Yeah. They literally dredged it, which is millions and millions of dollars, but it was, um, it was agricultural um, and really bad stuff so yeah. it's it's not dead anymore it's it's oh, a, it's not no it's the birds came oh. back it's amazing hey. amazing success story so um it, it it would probably benefit from these floating islands but it is um it it has been restored so do some research i i haven't um looked at it in a long time but i do know that it they did restore it and at the cost of millions um by by actually dredging the the sediment one big thing that um, you might like is doing these living shorelines is generally rated to like fight erosion and restore habitat is generally found to be $15 to $45 a foot. And that includes everything. So that the planning, that's the plants, that's you know the labor and everything. And you might be like $45 a foot, that's expensive. The average seawall can be over $2,000 a foot. Yeah. So don't use seawalls, use living shorelines. That goes for salt water, brackish water, fresh water. Generally the cheapest option is just to plant. Like I had one um, pond that they were debating using riprap, which is cheaper than a seawall for a two acre pond. It was going to be between 40 and $50,000. We did the entire project for 5,500. And now it's a butterfly habitat. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, so- And they also got all their birds. They stop the algae blooms, so. Cool. So you, you brought up the Aztecs. Now Leah asks, what sort of foods can be grown on the islands? So that depends. So one of the earliest wetland um, crops that was brought over is actually taro. And that's a very easy plant to grow on these islands. Um, you probably have to get a different pot than what we traditionally see on these islands. Lettuces are very good for hydroponics. Pretty much anything you can grow in hydroponics, you can grow on one of these islands. Um, some, some species of canna lily are edible. Elderberry will likely grow on these islands. There are different islands that sit at different heights out of the water. So you can actually have some where um, not all of the plant is under as underwater as the ones we were working on right there. So elderberry would be good. Anything that you can grow in hydroponics, you can grow here. But lettuces specifically come to mind. And obviously don't do anything that needs well-draining soil. No cactuses. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. So, uh, mm -hmm. oh, isn't taro invasive? Taro is invasive, which is why you would have to obviously worry about what you put on these islands. 
Um, and in fact, there are quite a few food crops that are starting to pop up on the invasive species list. Taro is not that good at spreading on its own. It's actually mostly because it's been used for hundreds of years in the Americas. It was a tradition, it was brought over as a slave crop um, very early on. So it's had a much longer time to spread than something like Brazilian pepper, which was brought over in the 1940s through 60s as a landscape plant and has now taken over our wetlands. Brazilian pepper does great on these islands. Don't let Brazilian pepper take hold. All right, I think that's, oh, yeah, Tom says you can grow about just about any vegetable. Yeah, so, all right. Well, thanks very much, um, Sean, that was great. And you could always tell a great presentation when you get lots of questions, so yeah. well done. If anyone ever has any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, it's really about, then I know I spent a lot of time talking about the fish and the other and like, you know, the erosion and the other stuff, but really a lot of lake gardening is not so much getting the plants to grow as keeping the rest of the system in check because the plants, as soon as they're in there, if, as long as you put them in the right spot, they will take over. I've seen a single gulf spike rush with this little root turn into about 20 to 30 stems in, a, in like a single season. So like in just spring, like the 10 to 15 times as much growth. So don't worry about them spreading. They'll do it. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Sean. That was, that was very interesting, Sean. Yeah. Great.